As if you'd not had enough of me talking about vapor barrier liners, here's another half an hour of it. This is Southern Alaska and it's another one of my tips and techniques episodes. Last time I shared tips for how to keep your socks and boot liners dry when exercising in very cold conditions, and for this instalment we'll stick to the same location, the not so shabby interior of Alaska in midwinter. In fact, good people of YouTube, I'm also going to recycle this little explainer and resigned expectation from the first part of the VBL duo. So instead of doing that novel route up on the North Slope, I'm down here in the south of Alaska. And as you can see, it's not particularly disappointing scenery. And it's here that I'm going to try and delve into various different aspects of campcraft, uh, clothing, equipment choices, and some techniques, which will hopefully be interesting and informative for as many of you as possible. For others, it'll just be an opportunity for you to complain about the way that I do things and to come up with your far, far better ways. And instead of heading along the valley route where I first offered my views and routines when it came to keeping gloves, mitts and boots dry, this time we need to camp first. I found a secluded spot in the middle of nowhere, although the leafless trees wouldn't have provided much shelter anyhow. Luckily there was barely a breath of wind, not uncommon on cold days inland, well away from the more grumpy coastal weather. This is one of a number of tents I use, a Hellsport Svalbard 5 Camp. As is typical with size ratings, it's hopeless for five people, uncomfortable for three, yet fine for two inhabitants. The camp bit in the name means that there's a porch area in addition to the main geodesic dome living quarters. They are well regarded expedition grade shelters and can handle wind direction changes better than lighter and simpler tunnel style tents. If there's enough snow, as there is here, I use expedition backcountry skis as my main corner anchors. You need to drive them at least a foot into fairly well compacted snow for them to hold before reaching ice, rock, vegetation, lava, whatever's under there. These skis have steel edges, so it's critical that you angle the ski undersides inwards, otherwise the steel will slice through even the best quality Dyneema cord tent edge loops. Once the structure is roughly in place, you then go through the typical sequence I won't over labour here. Lots of snow on the balance flaps, other smaller anchors for the remainder of the loops, and if there's no wind forecast, you can tidy the guy lines away with no need to deploy more protection, for now. And to the topic for today. Yes, it's part two of my Vapor Barrier Liner series, but I covered the rationale in the Hands and Feet episode, and since you have wisely seen that first, you know that these so-called VBLs are designed to stop body moisture from wetting out critically important garments that are supposed to insulate and so retain the heat your body has worked so hard to generate. Given this, I'll take you deeper into the reasoning and choices I make for my current sleeping system, which is of course always kept under review. You'll also have seen my video about tent life at well below minus 40 degrees, so you can see that it does work. First, you must begin with a clean, frost-free inner tent. If you're lazy in the morning and just pack up camp, this will be full of old snow and hoarfrost, roguishly ready to invade and wet out your equipment and sleeping gear. On moving us into the tent itself for the episode's main course, you'll have to forgive me for the very challenging filming conditions. Brightly coloured tents are all well and good for safety, but even the best efforts to set up camera fail to overcome the extreme colour casting of light coming through the red and yellow nylon. This is one reason why one of the new shelter concepts I am developing with friends at Alpkit has a neutral colour fly sheet, helping to keep colours natural inside. Voice over Alex can now hand over to real Alex. Okay then, I'm now going to take you through my evening and sleeping routine, including the equipment that I wear and the reasoning behind the choices that I've made in my system. I know that there's a load of different ways of doing this and there'll be a ton of outdoor experts who will have their own sleeping system, but this is the one that I've found works well in Arctic, in particular in low light level conditions. Now, as you can see, this is not low light levels. We're now in Alaska in the late afternoon, but I thought I would do it this time of day so you can see more of what's going on as opposed to everything being uh, flashlights and torches all over the place uh, flashing around and not being able to see very much detail at all. So without further ado, I'm now going to bring into the tent the equipment that I need, uh, which is going to go towards the back of the tent first, which will be my main sleeping bag. And my over bag, I can go down there for now. And then my various roll mats. So the first thing that we'll talk about is roll mats. Now a lot of people like using their inflatable pads but of course a speciality of almost every single inflatable sleeping pad in the world is their ability to deflate. You do not want that whether it's on day two, day 20, day 100, whatever. I tend to rely just on using foam pads and that means that as well as being 
yeah, I know they're a little bit bulky when you're packing them away in a sledge, for instance, but they can provide packing and protection around fragile items. So they have two roles. So the first one that I have is actually a, a double layer that I've made myself. And this is extra abrasion resistant. Uh, I can't actually remember exactly what type of foam it is. I think it's Evazote, but I will double check on that. Uh, and that's more or less just torso length. And then on top of that, I bring in the old uh, concertina, Z light, whatever sort of um, brand you want them to uh, come from. This, these ones are Thermbra Z lights. I think they're the original of this type, sort of the, um, the egg cup design. And they pack down nice and easily. They don't need to be strapped tight. They don't ping out uh, rather like this one does, which I tend to have on the top. We'll get to that one in a second. But anyhow, I tend to then lay out my, my Z lights depending on what sort of surface we're on. Sometimes I will have one Z light full length and then the other one half length. You can sort of fiddle around with whether you need more protection under one part of your body than another. So what we'll do here is have one Z light full length and then the other Z light folded over. Now, this is not going to be my top most layer. And the reason being, you'll see later, is that you can get a major problem with condensation. And of course, moisture can come from all sorts of different directions. And I'll go into detail about how you control moisture in a second. But I like my top layer to be flat foam because then there's nowhere for water to collect or for ice to collect overnight. And then that tends to re, uh, re soak things. So you try and keep the top layer solid flat one. So this is, again is a abrasion resistant foam not just a basic camping mat. Um, so these are a little bit more expensive, but I think they're worth it. And then this one can go on top. A slight compromise because these, because they are um, sort of almost like sprung loaded roll mats, they can take a little bit of time to get flat and uh, to stay put. But if you put a bag on the other end, normally they, uh, they're not too bad. Now, my next step is actually rather Oh, rather comfortably to yoink myself into the tent. Now you'll notice that I have not brought my boots into the tent because I want to make sure that the snow stays out there in the outer part of the tent and this stays a dry snow free zone. So my next job is to is to get boots off and those boots will be stored on their sides uh, and they'll also be tightened up around the cinching at the top to make sure that no snow comes in during the night. Because I always find no matter how well you protect a tent with snow blocks around, around the valances and around the door, a little bit of drift, particularly on a windy day, will find its way in. So, my tent booties. These are not filled full of goose down. These are actually Primaloft filled ones, so synthetic insulation. And I find that uh, in colder, darker places, these are fantastic. They weigh a little bit more than goose down, but if they get a tiny bit of moisture within them, they don't suddenly lose their ability to keep your feet warm. And so these are my next, my next step. Then they're, they're not fully waterproof bottoms, but you can get away with standing in the snow for a few moments uh, without them soaking out. All right. So making sure that my toes are all still there, which is by no means a dead cert. And the next job can be sorting out the actual sleeping bags themselves. You'll notice that I haven't, the first moment I've got into the tent, gone, ah, oh, long day over, sleeping bag out, straight in that to enjoy myself a nice comfortable evening. Instead, again, this is a moisture control thing. I actually keep my, uh, my sleeping bag inside its stuff sack as late as I can possibly get away with. And that means there's a limited chance, particularly whilst we're cooking over here, of any moisture vapor in the air ending up on or in the bag. So I want to protect that at all costs. That is my luxury, that is my survival. The sleeping bag really, really matters. If you find you've got any snowy lumps and bumps, this is the moment when you can use your knees to sort of knead them out. No matter how well you've compacted a snowy surface, you'll normally get a few lumps and bumps. The last thing you want that is sticking into certain parts of you during the night and trying to uh, get in the way of your, your slumber. So let's try and just use our knees and... Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, now it's time for the sleeping bag to come out. I 
the stuff sack I've got here is not the original one that comes with my, this is a mountain equipment, red line, goose down, sleeping bag, not a synthetic one, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I tend to find that my least favorite moment of the day is stuffing a sleeping bag back into its stuff sack. And so I tend to use one that's a bit big for any given sleeping bag so that I'm not forcing it into a tiny, tiny um, little, little sack. So this bag was actually from my old Denali sleeping bag, a big synthetic bag. And for that reason, it's significantly larger than you would need for this red line. And it just makes life in the morning when I'm already a little bit groggy, that little bit less tortuous as I'm trying to stuff it back in and pack up and get ready for a day ahead. So let's get this out. There is my nice dry sleeping bag. And one of the reasons that it is dry, this is my homemade VBL, vapor barrier liner. And this is the reason why this remains, huh, this sleeping bag remains dry during the night because it stops moisture from me getting into my down bag. So this is completely impermeable plastic. This is not uh, just polyurethane coated nylon, which a lot of VBLs are, which sort of stop moisture getting through, but not entirely. This is absolutely waterproof. Voice over Alex shall rudely interrupt at this point because real Alex neglected to go into more details about what really is the core topic of this episode, a special plastic bag of mine. This is heavy duty polyethylene. It was sold as a piano dust cover, but in reality it was just a vast sheet of the right sort of plastic. Waxy, good in the cold, and unlike rigid polyethylene, surprisingly easy to bond duct tape to. During the Dark Ice project days, we tested this plastic remorselessly in the extreme cold, trying to rip puncture and pull away the Gorilla Tape that we used to seal the third sides. We couldn't. And with daily use, it gets more pliable but never pinches or cracks. Brilliant. And at £30 for enough to make two VBLs, much cheaper than a handful of marketed versions that simply do not work. You can't just coat nylon with a polyurethane film and tape seal the seams and then call it a VBL, no matter how much you try. Some companies will relieve you of over £100 for about £10 of fabric, and at least others will admit to their limitations. In my view, either get a liner that truly creates a vapor barrier or change strategy entirely. You must stop body moisture entering the loft of your sleeping bag, even if it does so gradually. And no, hydrophobic goose down treatments are not the wonder solution. We finished ours off by fitting an elastic drawstring around the top, so gently cinching in just above the shoulder. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world, but you've just got to balance up. Do you want to be wet and damp and icy, or do you want to be dry and feel like you're sleeping slightly in a, in, a, in a plastic bag, which is exactly what you're doing. Right, so this goes inside. In fact, there's no particular reason why you shouldn't have this inside all the time. I'm now going to derobe and get myself in the sleeping bag. You want to wear as little as you can possibly get away with, and that can either mean nothing or next to nothing or you can get away with wearing a base layer uh, if you wish particularly in a vbl you do want to have something between your skin and it otherwise you will get very very clammy as your day clothing comes off you don't just lob it in a bag and hope for the best nothing is that simple in the cold you have to check each garment for a few things firstly to check that there's nothing like a camera battery accidentally left in a pocket second to see if they've incurred any tears or damage and finally a moisture test Sometimes it's hard in the cold to work out whether something is damp or just chilly, so if you're really not sure, press a small square of loo paper onto it and see if there's any sponging. The likely suspects are liner socks, guaranteed to be damp if you've used your boot VBL properly, and you can quickly dry these over the stove or around a hot Nalgene bottle. Also, check the inner linings of your soft shell or mid layer. Any dampness means that you need to put the garment back on until dry, or even use the stove to actively dry it out if you really have messed up your moisture control. Okay, I'm in. From this position here, I'm free to carry on with tasks inside the tent, like finishing up with the stove. Really, it should be off by now, but maybe tidying that away, putting flasks and putting uh, the stove in a position in the morning where I can get at it without having to clamber all the way into the outer tent and just generally organizing my life for the night ahead. And then I can do the second part of my overnight insulation, which is my overbag. Now, I used to use synthetic bags only, so both my inner and my outer bag would be synthetic. I've recently changed that because uh, the principle of having an inner and an outer bag is that you will essentially push any moisture that does appear outwards, outwards, outwards into the outer bag, which you can have as a, as a sacrificial bag, but you're always gonna be dealing with the compromise between weight, packability, 
and performance in the cold. And so this is actually now what I've decided is the best compromise between all those different factors. So having a high rated goose down filled inner bag, and then I'm going to get out my synthetic outer bag here. Of course, those stuff sacks can be used for putting clothes, uh, day clothes away safely and so that they can be kept away from any hoar frost that forms on the tent in or during the night. So no items that I have in here are going to be completely wasted. In fact, using stuff sacks temporarily is something that I'll do both during the day when I'm sledging and also when I'm in the tent in the evening. So we can then pull that outer bag on. Although I mentioned you might want to have your VBL living inside the main sleeping bag permanently, just so there's one thing less to do, I tend to store my overbag separately. This is particularly useful if that outer bag has, over a few weeks, picked up a little ice that you do not want transferred into your inner bag without body warmth ready to help push it back outwards. It's really important for your toe's sake to make sure that your overbag, the far, far end of it, doesn't touch the end or even the sides of the tent. Because if it does, then first it will wake you up, but secondly, you're more likely to get moisture on the, the, the toe end of either bag. And that's always going to be a recipe for getting cold feet during the night. And also trying to make sure that your pad system is long enough to take you where your head's going to be all the way down to your toes. I was talking about how you can use your stuff sacks for different things. My main stuff sack for my sleeping bag can now be used to pack away my, it should be completely dry soft shell. In here, plus you can put other items in there, salad pets, uh, your warm outer socks, various other things, they can go in there. And then this can, this can act as your pillow. There's no need to take a pillow with you as well. And most people will get a sense of how high they like their head to be up. And whether you're a, a back sleeper or a side sleeper, you can work, work out the best configuration for yourself there. And then you can get yourself ready for bed. Now, this would normally be done in the dark. I would still have a head torch on, of course, being able to uh, make sure that I'm not rolling into my teammate who will be where you currently are. Um, and also, uh, tidying things up with what you don't want to do in the morning is wake up and go oh where did I put this where did I, where did I put that everything has its place and that's why we want to keep a nice neat tidy tent particularly late in the evening early in the morning when you're working with the lowest light levels and also you're probably at your your groggiest and you don't want to make any mistakes break anything lose anything I have both of my bags with a zip on the same side so that I can quite easily encase myself and inside there will be a few storage pockets maybe for a head torch or for my liner gloves to go into because at this point this is now the last moment when I can actually get these off. These will be dry and they can pop inside there for the morning and then I can close everything up to about there. This is my, uh, an example of a hat I might wear in the evening time in the, in the tent. I also sometimes wear a nice big fur hat in the tent as well, but this is one that's absolutely fine right now. This can come off, again should be stowed in a stuff sack so that no hoarfrost falls on it. And then I can get my sleeping protection for my head out. This is a really important transition because during the night, particularly on cold nights, and I'm talking down below minus 35, minus 40 degrees, what you do not want is uh, the urge to slide down inside your sleeping bag and begin to breathe into it because moisture control is absolutely forefront in our minds if you're trying to keep a sleeping bag in condition for multiple days, multiple weeks. And so I want to try and discourage myself from when I'm, when I'm cold and groggy, maybe I'll wake up during the night for whatever reason, to slide down inside and start breathing into my insulation. And so what I tend to wear is this incredibly thin balaclava and it does not have a nose or a, or a mouth cut out, particularly because I want to make sure that my mouth and my nose stay warm and safe in their own little microclimate during the night. But it's so, so thin, so light, that in the morning I can dry it out in literally seconds, either over the stove or just by using body heat. So this means that when I'm actually inside my sleeping bag and I actually zip up for the evening, I keep my head fully out and so even if I'm drawing in cold, really, really frigid air, uh, I'm not tempted to slide down like this, like this, like this, 
and then breathe moisture all night long into the bag, which would be a disaster. And it also means I can stay alert if there's a, any form of emergency. I'm also not gonna be disorientated, buried down deep in my sleeping bag. When you wake up in the morning, the process is more or less a complete reverse of that. Apart from the fact you will probably have, despite your best efforts, accumulated some hoarfrost, which is, which is sort of like a snowy uh, film, which, which settles on the inside of this tent canvas here. It's annoying, it's inconvenient, and if you touch the inside of the tent, it will rain down upon you. So you've got to try and keep yourself and your sleeping bag and the overbag away from it. Sometimes, if the hoarfrost is bad, I will put a loose layer of nylon, of, um, of poly polyurethane coated nylon, over the top of me. Not, not a full bivy bag, but just a, a slight shield, uh, which stops anything falling on top and then melting into the, uh, melting into the top surface. When you choose your combination of sleeping bag and overbag, you've got to take into account the temperatures that you're expecting to be sleeping in. Of course, there will be a range, but you've got to make your best guess. And the reason behind that is that if the insulation that you've got around you is not quite sufficient, the outside might actually be above freezing point. That's a big problem. If you've been sleeping with insufficient insulation, you'll find that the freezing point won't be somewhere within the layers, possibly around where it transitions from over bag to inner bag. It might actually be on the outside. And that means that first of all, you will be losing a lot of heat, but secondly, you might actually have dampness on the outside of your sleeping bag. And that is really not what we want. We want the outside of the over bag to remain frozen all night long. And that means that you've selected the correct combination of over bag and, and inner bag. I'm now going to pretend to be asleep, like all the other camping YouTubers who pretend that they are waking up, despite having the camera suspiciously ready positioned and recording. But now I'm awake again. It can be really tempting to now reach out, unzip the inner tent, and basically start cooking and getting ready for the day ahead whilst still being in the comfort of, of your sleeping bag. But inevitably there will be some vapour being created once you get the stove on and a kettle on and start cooking breakfast, having a hot chocolate and all that stuff. And so really, you've got to just uh, brave it out and get all of this packed away because you do not want moisture landing on the outside of it and starting to worm its way in. As you can see, the sun is still just about up and it's providing a tiny bit of warmth on the side of the tent. And so even though it's not minus 40 degrees at this very moment, uh, it doesn't make getting my sleeping bag into its stuff sack, its oversized stuff sack, any more fun but uh, it's got to be done. You can't just bash this into your sled, uh, otherwise it will take up pretty much half of the volume. I normally leave my VBL inside this, so I don't have to put one inside the other every single evening, um, but you've just got to make sure that it doesn't get stuffed down in the, in, the, uh, in the toe section, and you have to then try and extricate it and find out where the opening is, try and keep the whole thing laid out inside the sleeping bag. And I'm going to repeat this, and I know that it does seem cruel on yourself, but it's a really good idea to get this done and away from any sources of moisture like the stove and uh, vapour coming out of flasks or food mugs or anything like that. Get this done beforehand, and that means that your sleeping bag will stay in condition for days, weeks and even months, particularly if you've gone with the compromise of using goose down, because on a lot of expeditions, there is no ability to dry out wet goose down. And if it gets wet, it gets icy, it's gonna be like that for the rest of the trip. And so you're committed. I can now start to roll up my sleeping gear. I tend to use these uh, Z lights, these uh, concertina style ones in a block, which becomes a seat. And I can then sit with my legs out into the outer part of the tent with my boots on, getting the stove on and everything, um, but sitting slightly higher up using these as a, um, as a bit of a chair, which is, it's pretty comfortable. Um, although sometimes you get uh, cramp in your abs and have to lie back and sort of release that for a few seconds, the problems that we get. I also tend to get leg cramps in here. Um, not after I've hydrated in the morning, but in that period when you've just woken up, maybe you didn't drink quite enough in the evening. I only really tolerate one of these roll-ups because I find that they can be a bit unruly. Um, and in fact, I may well swap this out at some point for another completely flat one because things that are in a roll shape like this don't actually stow as easily as you might think. These boots were stored in the tent porch on their sides, closed up against any overnight drift snow intrusion, and so were dry for another day's toil. 
I know I covered feet VBLs in the first of these two episodes, and here's a card on the top corner to direct you back to it, but just to reiterate, a thin liner sock, a foot VBL, a thick knee-high sock, and then my flexible boots with extra-long polyester orange laces, naturally. The insulated tent booties must be checked for moisture and then packed away. If it's sunny, you could air them out in the sun to dry by sublimation, but only if strapped down well. Here's my most recent, always under review sequence of soft sleeping stuff then. Two Z lights, a roll mat topper, my down bag, synthetic over bag, and my Eversote foam hiding underneath. And now I'm showing you two old cardboard boxes. Why? Well, this is how I stuff pack sleeping bags and puffy insulated clothing for inside check luggage when I'm flying by air. It's well compressed and a much easier shape to organize within a larger travel bag. Weird, but worth it. I know it's been a necessarily compromised on location explainer video due to the filming setup and it's a relief to be back into the natural outdoor light once more. Nope, back into horrible red and yellow color casts again. In the mornings, we sweep out any snow or grot and then close up all the zips. Carelessly flapping doors, linings and so on tend to contribute to snags and confusion when putting tents up and down under pressure, so we have a routine and we stick to it. I'm going to work on increasing our collection of Arctic videos in the upcoming months. Some will be me pontificating about techniques, kit advice and tips, and others just sharing experiences. I have a backlog of cold weather footage since my Alan the Lifeboat series has had total priority this year so far. So, good news. Who knew my YouTube channel would become more densely populated with videos linked to what I actually do for a living, not the peculiar yet thoroughly rewarding distraction that is lifeboating? For those of you wondering about what I'm up to here, I do not fully collapse and pack away most types of tent. This hell sport doesn't sausage as well as tunnel tents, but you can make a reasonable job of it. Sausaging is when you fold the tent flat and then roll from one end. Finally, you can store it inside a long tent bag for strapping down on or into a sledge. It massively speeds up daily tent routines as the pre-taped poles stay roughly half-seated in their sleeves and only fold once. Even though I didn't film this in a glamorously remote part of Alaska, this huge southern valley was spot on for training, tweaking and experimenting with equipment and systems. Plus, of course, just reminding myself why I've spent so many years sacrificing a predictable life for time in these cold places. Hard to justify which, along a parallel plane, makes it instantly justifiable. More soon, you lot. Bye.